Part of me still wants to hold on to this one last moment, the moment where you still get to believe this is a joke, an error, a big nothing. The moment before you know for sure that something has started that you can no longer stop. I unfold the paper. Owen's note is short. One line, its own puzzle. Protect her. Green Street, before it was Green Street. I met Owen a little over two years ago. I was still living in New York City then. I was living 3,000 miles from Sausalito, the small northern California town that I now call home. Sausalito is on the other side of the Golden Gate from San Francisco, but a world away from city life. Quiet, charming, sleepy. It's the place that Owen and Bailey have called home for more than a decade. It is also the polar opposite of my previous life, which kept me squarely in Manhattan, in a lofted storefront on Green Street in Soho, a small space with an astronomical rent I never quite believed I could afford. I used it as both my workshop and my showroom. I turn wood. That's what I do for work. People usually make a face when I tell them this is my job, however I try to describe it. Images of their high school woodshop class coming to mind. Being a woodturner is a little like that, and nothing like that. I like to describe it as sculpting, but instead of sculpting clay, I sculpt wood. I come by the profession naturally. My grandfather was a woodturner, an excellent one at that, and his work was at the center of my life for as far back as I can remember. He was at the center of my life for as far back as I can remember, having raised me mostly on his own. My father, Jack, and my mother, Carol, who preferred that I refer to her as Carol, were largely uninterested in doing any child-rearing. They were largely uninterested in anything except my father's photography career. My grandfather encouraged my mother to make an effort with me when I was young, but I barely knew my father, who traveled for work 280 days a year. When he did have time off, he hunkered down at his family's ranch in Suwannee, Tennessee, as opposed to driving the two hours to my grandfather's house in Franklin to spend time with me. And shortly after my sixth birthday, when my father left my mother for his assistant, a woman named Gwendolyn who was newly 21, my mother stopped coming home as well. She chased my father down until he took her back. Then she left me with my grandfather full time. If it sounds like a sob story, it isn't. Of course, it isn't ideal to have your mother all but disappear. It certainly didn't feel good to be on the receiving end of that choice. But when I look back now, I think my mother did me a favor exiting the way she did, without apology, without vacillation. At least she made it clear. There was nothing I could have done to make her want to stay. And on the other side of her exit, I was happier. My grandfather was stable and kind, and he made me dinner every night and waited for me to finish dinner before he announced it was time to get up and read me stories before we went to sleep. And he always let me watch him work. I loved watching him work. He'd start with an impossibly enormous piece of wood, moving it over a lathe, turning it into something magical. Or if it was less than magical, he would figure out how to start over again. That was probably my favorite part of watching him work, when he would throw up his hands and say, well, we've got to do this different, don't we? Then he'd go about finding a new way into what he wanted to create. I'm guessing any psychologist worth her salt would say that it must have given me hope, that I must have thought my grandfather would help me do the same thing for myself, to start again. But if anything, I think I took comfort in the opposite. Watching my grandfather work taught me that not everything was fluid. There were certain things that you hit from different angles, but you never gave up on. You did the work that was needed, wherever that 